How's it going, everybody? Saxophonist Ryan Devlin here. Today, we're going to share with you five ways of thinking about jazz improvisation beyond scales and arpeggios. Of course, scales and arpeggios are super important, and we're going to be practicing them forever. But when you think about different artists, ranging from Charlie Parker all the way to Michael Brecker, there's a lot of information there, and there's several new concepts going on between Charlie Parker's playing and Michael Brecker's playing. We're going to tackle five of these new concepts, and I'm going to go through them with you today. And all of these concepts we're going to discuss can be found in my new jazz lesson video resource called 80 Intervallic Phrases, where I've written 80 lines out over various chord progressions. And these lines showcase five different modern soloing techniques. All of these are going to be written in all 12 keys for you, and I've provided recordings of each one of the lines, as well as backing tracks, so you can try them out for yourself. If you're interested in downloading this new resource package, you can check it out in the link in the description below. And if you use code BEYOND5, you get $5 off the purchase. So let's dive right into it. So the first way that we can go beyond thinking of scales and arpeggios over chord progressions is using intervals, specifically wide intervals like fourths and fifths. So what does this mean? Well, a fourth, specifically the interval called a perfect fourth, is when two notes are played five chromatic steps away from each other. And a perfect fifth is when two notes are played seven chromatic tones away from each other. When you pair these intervals together in random orders, it makes a pretty unique sound. So now let's take a look at one of our phrases from our resource so that we can hear this concept in action over a 251. Let's hear it first and then we'll break it down. So let's analyze this line. Why does this line work? Well, when we're thinking about fourths and fifths, there's lots of cool systematic patterns that we can try out. And this is really a systematic pattern that I'm aiming for the major chord. So even though I start in that D minor tonality with D, A, E, and B, I then take this other fourth slash fifth cell outside of our key change with D flat, G flat, A flat, E flat. So that raises that tonality almost as if I'm playing like E flat minor or A flat seven. Then I go up to a common tone of G seven and continue the shape that I played before on D minor seven, but starting on F now. So F, B, F sharp, C sharp continuing that, and then taking the cycle up another step, up to G sharp, where I'm playing like A flat minor tonality over G7, and then I resolve to G. So really, the pattern itself is D da D da D da da, the first seven notes. So it's a seven note pattern, and then I just push that up in different cycles from there. So B da D da D da da, ba D da D da D da da, ba D, and then I resolve to the major chord. All right, let's move on to our second concept now. This is a concept that we call angular playing. This is kind of a combination of all different types of large intervals in randomized orders. This gives us a sort of vertical sound that contrasts the more traditional horizontal sound of lines. What's really cool about playing angular is it doesn't mean necessarily that you have to play notes outside of a chord change or outside of a tonality. One of my favorite saxophone players that does this concept really well is Chris Potter. I've transcribed a lot of his lines throughout my development, and I've realized that you can play a C major chord in a bunch of different ways is just thinking about playing angular, meaning larger intervals than a third. See if you can hear what I'm talking about. Let's talk about this angular shaped line over a 2-5-1. So angular shapes are just combinations of large interval lines. They can be diatonic, they can be non-diatonic, and for this one, I wanted to kind of combine the non-diatonic and diatonic. So here we have that first shape with a tritone at the beginning, B, to F natural, I was thinking kind of like D minor six nine tonality, B natural, F, G, and then we go to A flat, so tritone substitution there, and play A flat to E flat, that's another fourth, then down the A flat scale to B natural on the downbeat of the dominant chord, and then a really wide interval here, B, E, A, D, so that's that combination of fourths and fifths there, up to a chromatic shape, 
on E flat, so off the flat 13, I resolve chromatically to the major seven of my C major chord and then do another wide interval arpeggio down. B, E, B, F sharp, G. So really, I like practicing tunes or progressions or whatnot, just thinking about the theme of wide intervals, not giving myself any harmonic handcuffs, meaning you know staying away from a certain thing or only doing a certain thing, but just thinking about the intervals. And as you see throughout this resource, I start messing around with different variants of patterns in fourths and fifths, kind of in random orders, wide jumps. There's some ninths in here as well, uh, some octaves. Great for technique work on saxophone, but also really cool to make your lines sound a little bit different. You can disguise a lot of cool harmony um, or even basic harmony tricks um, with wider intervals because you know the ear can kind of hears a, a fourth or a fifth is almost like it's its own tonality in a way you know it's hard to see exactly what it is even if it's diatonic and like I said Chris Potter I think is one of the best at this uh, hearing him play you know major chords and, and minor chords and dominant chords just intervallically and it sounds completely different even though it's it's diatonic so uh, check out this part of the resource and make up your own lines thinking about just wide intervals put together all right, now let's move on to our third example. This is a concept that we're calling overtone matching. Overtone matching can be defined in a lot of different ways, but the way that I wrote it in this book is the concept of false fingerings. This is a tradition that's been in saxophone players' vocabulary for many, many years. This false fingering technique makes notes that have the same pitch have a different timbre. Here's an example of me playing a couple notes in the high register of my saxophone, where I play the normal note with a normal fingering, and then following that, I will play the false fingering or the overtone match. One of my favorite saxophone players that uses this false fingering technique is John Coltrane. He was the first one to really start this angular style of false fingering that people like Steve Grossman, Michael Brecker, Bob Mincer, Dave Liebman really took and ran with in the 70s and beyond. So check those guys out as you're checking out this resource for some inspiration. All right, so now let's look at a line from our resource. Okay, so for this overtone matching, I'm thinking about false fingerings from the sixth of the minor chord and then the third of the dominant chord resolving to the third of the major chord. And all I'm doing for this is fingering, you know, a B natural with the octave key and then laying my right hand down. And this kind of makes uh, a B flat almost, like a really sharp B flat on the tenor, but it has like that kind of wah, 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 right, for the B natural. Then I do the same thing on A natural. You know, kind of keeps that, that almost like wah sound on the guitar. So all these overtone matching lines that I've written are lines that I like without the overtone matching that I'm just adding, you know, some of these false fingerings and such into the lines, as you'll see. So my advice for these practicing them yourself, besides reading them all the way through, is thinking about these like lines that you like already on, on your horn. How could you add a note or two uh, with a false fingering or an overtone to make the line sound a little bit different? I love doing that. You know, if you created the bare bones of this line, it would just be like six, one, six, one, three, five, three, five, three, you know, over the two, five, one. So that's what I would recommend doing when practicing these kinds of things is uh, take lines you're already comfortable with and then, uh, you know, add some false fingerings and some different um, overtones to it and see what you can kind of come up with. Our fourth concept to go over from our resource is melodic cells. Now, melodic cells and chromatic cells can be found in a couple different ways. The way I define it is when you take a group of notes that have a clear starting and ending point and can vary as much or as little chromatically. So I like to think about the starting note of a cell and the ending note of the cell. So for example, one of my favorite ones is one major seven flat seven one. So if we think about this over C7, we have C, B natural, B flat, C. That could be a melodic cell when you think about it in the context of it being over C, and it could be a chromatic cell if you think about it in the context of it being over C sharp seven. The word melodic and chromatic can be moved around based on the chord that it's being played on. So throughout this section of the resource, I take these chromatic cells and I move them around inside and outside of the chord changes so you can hear the difference in sound of the chromatic version of the cell and the melodic version of the cell. And this is all context-based. So let's talk about why this melodic cell line works. What I was thinking about when writing this melodic cell line here was taking different shapes of these melodic cells and putting them together kind of weaving through tonalities here. So as you can see, we're playing a two, five, one in C again, 
and uh, we're starting to lick inside of D minor with F, G, A, F. Then we go outside and play a chromatic cell starting on A flat, that cell I talked about at the beginning. One major seven, flat seven, one. Then I'm thinking about playing the altered scale in melodic cells. So over the dominant seven chord, I'm thinking like A flat melodic minor. So that to me is that altered sound over G7. And I'm thinking about that in two melodic cells. One is starting on the six, six, five, four, one, and then four, five, six, one, just backwards. And then I resolve to C major there. So again, thinking about starting the line inside with two different shaped melodic cells, and then going to an altered sound with two different melodic cells, and then resolving to the major chord. So thinking about this in the context of different melodic cells, there's four different shapes here, but really I'm thinking about the overarching tonalities in which those cells are giving off. So I start inside like a minor pentatonic kind of sound, and then I transition to A flat melodic minor, for a bar and a half pretty much, and then resolve to C major. What's really cool about these melodic cells is they're almost like little Lego pieces. You can put them together. So even throughout this resource, you can take a couple of melodic cells from different lines and put them together and make your own version of a 2-5-1 phrase. We also have other really great Jazz Lesson video resources just on melodic cells where I learned a lot of these shapes from. The final concept we're gonna go over today is pentatonic shifting. Pentatonic shifting is when we take two or more pentatonic scales that are inside and outside of our tonality, combine them together, and play them over a progression. For this example, we're gonna look at a minor two, five, one lick using a couple different pentatonic scales. So let's take a look. Okay, so let's analyze this pentatonic shifting line over a minor two five. So here I'm thinking about a couple pentatonic concepts. So over that D minor seven flat five, I'm thinking about definitely portraying the sound of F minor over D minor seven flat five. You'll notice that there's no A flat in that scale. That's because I'm gonna use the A flat tonality over the dominant chord. Then we go to G dominant pentatonic with B, D, F, and G just for four notes. Then we go to A flat major pentatonic, E flat, C, B flat, A flat. And then I would resolve to C minor seven pentatonic, G, E flat, C, G, E flat. Pentatonic shifting to me is knowing the difference between common tones and resolving tones, and also chromatic tones. You can think about any pentatonic from one of the chord tones. So from D, from F, from A flat, from C, even from the flat nine or the natural nine, E and E flat. So I was kind of getting the sound of that F dominant seven or F minor seven over D minor seven flat five. Then a little bit of resolution when I go to G dominant seven over the G seven flat nine chord. And then I play off the flat nine for the last four bars to grow some tension on the G seven flat nine chord, getting that dominant pentatonic and then resolving to our root pentatonic on C minor seven. So really thinking about pentatonic shifting is knowing what common tones you wanna use and knowing what tension tones you wanna use. And you can have pentatonics be just a four note cell. It could be an eight note cell. But really the key is knowing where you're gonna resolve and what points you wanna bring tension to. The extension tones on a minor two five, like the flat five and the flat nine uh, on the minor chord and the dominant chord are good starting points, but you can really use any extension chord and play dominant or minor pentatonic off of them. So the flat nine, sharp nine, sharp 11, flat 13. All right, so that concludes today's video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoy this resource and this video. If you wanna download our new resource, 80 Intervallic Phrases, you can in the link in the description below. And don't forget to use code BEYOND5 for $5 off your purchase. And if you found this video helpful, please consider leaving a like and subscribe as it really helps grow the channel. Thanks again, everyone, and I'll see you next time.